Thanks, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Um, and I'm sitting in sunny Townsville, and I'd like to welcome Adrian to give this presentation. Um, Sarah said she did send around Adrian's um, uh, more abstract the other day. So a lot of you hopefully have read uh, what the um, talk today is going to be about, but some of you may not have um, heard Adrian speak before. I was lucky enough to see him at the um, NH and MRC trip um, workshop at the end of last year where he was talking about um, the waste in research and the abolition of league tables. So Adrian's very passionate about um, improving the quality of research and that'll come through very clearly in his presentation today. Um, he's had a NH and MRC project, um, fun, a funded project on streamlining grant applications. And so a lot of his interest is in streamlining research, the grant application and the ethics processes. And in fact, I think he'll probably even do a, um, a bit of a, a blurb for his uh, petition that he has currently. Um, so um, I invite you to listen to Adrian. If you have any questions as Adrian's going through, please type them in so that I can um, present them to him at the end of the session. Thanks, Adrian. Great. Well, thanks, Tilly and Sarah, for the invite. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to start. This is a great slide. Uh, this comes from an illustration in Nature. And it kind of shows very graphically and in a very humorous way the uh, problem I'm going to be talking about. So, you know, in my career, and there are a lot of great scientists out there, but they seem to slip up uh, when it comes to the numbers. And everybody tells me uh, how much they hate statistics and, and how difficult they find it. So. Um, which is funny because a lot of <laughs> my, my immediate answer to that is, well, why are you doing such complicated statistics? You know, why not do uh, a much more simple study? Um, so there's this kind of pressure on people to do complicated things, but then at the same time, they lack the skills and they make very simple mistakes. Of course, I'm conscious that uh, I'm a statistician, so I'm bound to say I think statistics is important. You know, every uh, everybody you meet uh, will tell you how fantastically important and wonderful their job is even met an estate agent once who seemed to claim that he was solving problems of world hunger so i am conscious that uh it's very e easy for me to spot mistakes and have a dig but i will say you know there are real consequences to doing this and if you if you mess up with an individual patient you might cause harm on an individual level but we have seen big examples where there's when the statistics have been mucked up you can uh, have massive consequences i mean two examples that spring to mind uh, it wasn't in health, but the, um, you know, the researchers from Harvard who mucked up an Excel spreadsheet and that led to uh, this support for austerity uh, around the world that showed that the more austere you are to your population, the better uh, the, 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 there were huge long term benefits. And that was just completely wrong. The data didn't show that. And the other great example you can look up is about the worm wars and all the money that's gone into deworming. Um, that does look like uh, that may have just been a simple stats error. So we have a problem, uh, and here's again from Nature, and Nature are very interested in this issue, which is good to see, you know, one of our best journals uh, are worried about this problem. So Nature asked uh, hundreds and, uh, well, 1,500 scientists, uh, is there a reproducibility crisis? So this is, you know, the reproducibility crisis means that a lot of research just can't be reproduced. So the original researchers did it, but when somebody else tries to use it or, or reproduce it, it doesn't work. And you can see there that we've got, uh, you know, most people saying, yes, there's a crisis. So 52% a significant crisis, 38% uh, a slight crisis, and just 3% thinking there's not a crisis. So there definitely is a perception amongst scientists uh, that this is a problem, probably just based on their own experience. However, uh, and, and here's me being super statistically critical straight away, there's a problem with this question. <laughs> First of all, what is a slight crisis? I mean, either there's a crisis or not. But you can see that the researchers have given, uh, well, in this case, it's a journalist, has given two answers for yes and one for no. So straight away, you, you are pushing people uh, towards the yes answer. So there is a reproducibility crisis in the uh, studies of reproducibility, I would say, is what this paper is showing. And then uh, I think Doug, Altman, who tragically uh, died last year, who was a fantastic researcher and fantastic uh, statistician, 
back in 1994, so all the way back in 94 in the BMJ, um, he coined, he said this sentence, which has been said over and over again. He said, we need less research, better research and research done for the right reasons. So, you know, we all can see the benefits of health and medical research and when it's done well, but at the moment we're living in a world where we, ju we just have too much. Uh, and a lot of it is of very low quality. Now, Doug said that in 1994, what happened immediately after then, or it's kind of in the, uh, in the early stages of it, but we've actually had this massive explosion uh, that you can see here, you know, this exponential increase in the number of systematic reviews and the number of trials and, and all sorts of papers. Uh, and this was documented by Hilda Bastian, you know, back in 2010, where they talked about 75 trials and 11 systematic reviews a day. Well, that's now gone up to 26 systematic reviews per day. And there are areas, uh, multiple areas of, of research now where we have more systematic reviews than we do original studies, which is just incredibly daft. One of the reasons for that is that systematic reviews are at the top of this uh, evidence pyramid, um, which I don't think is really that useful. But what that's done is it's meant that people publish systematic reviews because they're seen as high quality and this, and they get a lot of citations. So we've told people that systematic reviews are great and therefore people will produce a lot of systematic reviews. And also it's a relatively easy study to do. You don't have to get ethics and go out and collect data. So a lot of, um, a lot of doctors I know are sort of forced to do a study uh, for, for their uh, colleges. And, and, and that's another thing that fuels this kind of explosion. And all this explosion really makes it hard to, to work out what on earth is going on. It's, it's kind of adding sludge to the system. A, a lot of it is repetitive and a lot of it is unnecessary. Of course, still some good quality ones in there. Um, and, you know, trials are a great way of answering the question. But a lot of these trials that are being uh, done are probably, you know, well, we certainly have seen multiple examples of where people have run a trial without realizing that there's uh, a good trial already exists because they just didn't do a proper search. And of course, the loop of that is it's getting harder to do searches because there's just so much stuff out there. And I think as, as Tilly mentioned, uh, I've talked about this before at the NHMRC, I think lead tables are a terrible idea. Uh, we have this publish or perish culture. I'm sure every, everybody who's a researcher has felt this need uh, to get papers out there. And this, this pressure create, causes researchers to cut corners and not do the proper checking. So we already have this pressure and then the league tables on top, you know, the, the universities and institutions are just interested in getting, or a lot of them are, the citations, the dollars and the numbers. And it's, it's actually really ironic. If you look at so many university websites, you will see that there are loads of them. And, and this has been documented by an, uh, an American researcher where the, the banner headline and one of the first things you'll see is where they are in a league table or how much income they got last year. You have to dig to find out what they actually did with that money, which is obviously far more important. These markers uh, and, and citations and publication numbers are very poor proxies for quality or what's actually going on in the university. Um, but these league tables like the Times Higher Ed have become incredibly powerful and, and seem to be becoming more powerful all the time and are driving, uh, I would say, some very perverse decisions at universities. You know, these fields where maybe research is more difficult and maybe it's slower, you know, they're the one <laughs> they're not getting invested in. The fields that are more likely to get papers in nature and science, they're, they're the ones getting supported. Um, and of course, whilst those areas are important, we need to have a diversity. We can't all be um, doing that kind of research. Some research is very local uh, and not going to be in big job, but it's still very important and, and could actually inform local practice. And I mean, this is a crazy example, but <laughs> some of the lengths that people will go to, um, but this particular group got 31 papers out of the same study. And you can see some of the titles there. Uh, basically, they just uh, changed the province in Iran and just, you know, churned out. Um, these papers and, and these people were obviously caught and, and these papers were retracted but you know there are lots of other people not being caught doing this kind of salami slicing and, it, and it's really not useful um, it, again it's just adding sludge to the system uh, and it's, it's not what we need 
And here's a great quote, and I, lo I love this image as well. Uh, this is from Bruno Kerma. It pays to be first. It doesn't necessarily pay to be right. There is a huge rush to get things out there, to get things first, to get the splashy headline. And again, this rush and this cutting corners um, is, is, is one of the big reasons we have such poor quality research. And I love this image, you know, the, the researchers there, they got their lab coat on and they just, you know, they made a basic mistake and all this money um, is pouring away. And I think I see this a lot in statistics. I see a lot of, uh, or I see a lot of great scientists who are, you know, expert in their field. They, they can run, they know how to use these multi-million dollar machines and they get all this awesome data and they spend years sometimes collecting data from difficult to reach participants and then they absolutely butcher the statistical analysis and i just think all that time and effort um, is now you know not returning uh, the full value that it could and i remember just a couple of years ago seeing this massive study where you know they put all these uh, trainers into africa to reach all these difficult villages and collected this uh beautiful continuous measure of malnutrition and they they did repeated uh measures of you know they, they, they measured the malnutrition twice and they went back and they checked all the trainers and they validated and all this interrelated reliability and then they got this measure of malnutrition for the analysis and just turned it into a high low so they just threw away um millions of dollars worth of interesting variants in their study just because they couldn't deal with a continuous measure, I believe, and I think they just found it easier to talk about high, low, malnourished, yes, no. And then a seminal paper in this kind of in this field of, of meta research or, or using research to improve research uh, comes from John Ioannidis, who's at Stanford, who's an incredible scientist. And back in 2005, uh, he wrote a paper that's mostly based on simulation informed by um, informed by empirical evidence, with the shocking conclusion that most published scientific um, papers are false. And that is an incredible thing to think of. And now, and, and, and in fact, now when I'm reading a paper, I start with the prior hypothesis that this paper is wrong and the authors need to convince me that they've done it right, that they haven't made uh, a very simple error, that they've told me everything that they did, that they followed a good research plan, that they're reporting honestly, because all those mistakes uh, you know, it's, you need to get everything right. You get one of those things wrong um, and you've wasted uh, your paper and all your effort. And, and this paper, I think it's got over 2.5 million views now on POS Medicine. It's the most viewed paper of all time. And it's been very um, influential in a huge number of um, fields. And then some work done by um, Paul Blasio and Ian Chalmers that's been in the BMJ. Um, talked about the five stages of research now as I said before you have to get each one of these stages has to be um, really well done uh, otherwise if you fail at any stage you, you know you've, you've wasted your time and everybody's time and unfortunately empirical data shows and, and so, you know this has been repeated in the last few years a lot of people say oh this is a historic problem but we still see sort of 50% of studies that are designed without looking at existing systematic reviews. So straight away, there's a huge potential there for you to do something that's already been done or make the previous mistakes. You know, you're not learning um, from what people have done in the past. And 50% of studies fail to reduce bias using the simplest things like blinding. Um, blinding is something that we have known about for centuries and it, dramatically improves the quality of your study but i've met so many researchers who don't do it and it is fantastically easy to do it's only a little bit of extra um, paperwork and, and, and sometimes you know getting your colleague to look at the results down the test tube or down the microscope rather than yourself um, but it's been demonstrated uh, you know there's really strong evidence that this gives better quality results I mean, the other really disappointing thing is that 50% of studies are never published or never published in full. So they might, you might see an abstract at a conference and then it, and then it just goes missing or, or you see nothing. And we've looked at NHRC trials um, that were funded about 10 years ago. And yeah, again, there's around 50%. We could just not find, we could not find a single paper. Uh, and that is a huge source of waste. 
and maybe something went wrong in the trial, which is, you know, this does happen, something outside the investigator's control, but we still need to publish a paper explaining why it went wrong so that more people don't then pursue that avenue. You know, you need, we, we can learn from mistakes. It's, it's fine for things to go wrong because that does happen, but um, to just have nothing for these studies where we've put in 700,000 to a million dollars um, is a real uh, terrible waste. Then even when it's published, uh, it's uh, the Salmon to number four here, um, so much of it is so badly written. Uh, you cannot tell what people have done. And then people who want to implement this and read a paper, they, they you know, if it's describing some intervention, um, they can't tell what done. They, they can't tell what stats analysis was used. They can't really tell what data uh, people used. So if we look at 50% waste at stages two, three, and four, that means that 85% of research in health and medical research is currently wasted, which is over 100 and $100 billion per year. That is an incredibly shocking picture. And actually we think this 85% is higher uh, in some fields because some fields uh, are even worse at some of these things. And I haven't even mentioned number five, you know, the translating research. We're not, researchers are currently not rewarded uh, for translating research into practice. I've spoken to a couple of researchers who did these fantastic studies uh, you know, implemented something in their own hospital and, uh, you know, they say, well, I want to go out and implement this across Australia, but there is, you know, my health service does not want me to do that. There is no incentive for me to do that. There's no funding for me to do that. So these, these great evidence-based um, interventions or changes to policy never go anywhere because all we're judged on is our, is our citations and our papers, not on how we've actually um, improved people's lives. And I mean, there's some move from the NHMRC towards that. And I think, you know, I think what they've said on this issue has been good, but ultimately it's, it's, you know, it's, it's researchers and our colleagues who are judging this. And a lot of us, unfortunately, um, when we're faced with a difficult decision about who to fund, a lot of us will fall back on, on looking at people's CVs and just looking uh, at the number of papers. Cause you know, that's, that's got some veneer of, um, of quality, even though it's, it's really just a quantity measure, not quality. P-values have been in the news quite a bit in the last few years. And uh, well, for us, a bit, for statisticians, they've been in the news for 50 years. And even soon after they were invented, a lot of statisticians were like, well, these are imperfect. But for some reason, they have taken off <laughs> and they have taken off big style and they have become the most important statistic for a lot of people in a lot of journals when really at best they should be the fifth or sixth most important statistic and here's an awesome job uh, sorry an awesome book by uh ziliak and mcploskey i mean just the title the cult of statistical significance how the standard error cost us jobs justice and lives so they go through a huge number of examples in all sorts of different fields of science where people focusing on the p-value has led them to completely misinterpret um, what the data is saying. And the great, I like the great quote that's, or one of the great quotes of Zudak Plosky is they talk about sizeless scientists. Because the p-value will tell us absolutely nothing about the clinical or public health significance. It, it, it really tells us a very, very limited thing. And most people, when you tell them what a p-value is, they, they cannot give you the correct definition anyway. So p-values really are should not be the first thing reported in abstracts. What should be reported in abstracts is how big is the effect that we've shown? What's the, the confidence interval or what's the um, uncertainty around that interval? And what does it actually mean? And then another quote I really like from Ken Rothman, who's a very good epidemiologist, is he calls it the confusing fog of statistical significance testing. And I really like that because I've seen people get bound up in this they, get, they do kind of get lost in the fog of statistical significance and, and actually well all the interesting stuff is just over here um, but you're um, and you're getting tied up over here and in particular I mean journals are really bad for this you know I've seen um, some really bad reviews from from uh, from journal reviewers that just focus on the significance and are missing the whole thing and then of course you feel as if you have to put the p-values in um, because you want to get that paper out there and the New England Journal is actually pretty bad at this. Uh, so this is a paper on ECMO. 
uh, which is a uh, you know a very intensive therapy for very very sick people whose uh, whose lungs and I'm pretty sure it's just their lungs uh, have given out, and and so they need this uh, machine to help them breathe. And this is a kind of bright line thinking. So here's you can see uh, a survival, a couple of mile curve here of two groups, the ECMO group and the, and the control group, and we can see a p value of 0.07. Um, why the hell we've got probability down to zero anyway? Uh, really should have truncated the y-axis at 0.5 there so we could focus on the interesting detail but anyway that's another bugbear of mine and we can see you know a, a, a clear the, the lines do seem to separate uh, and it does look like the ECMO group is better but because the New England Journal have a very strict ruling about p-values that p-value of 0.07 what they had to write up in the abstract was that ECMO was not statistically significantly beneficial now, as an individual, <laughs> I, would, I would want the ECMO treatment, I would say, and I would want the ECMO treatment for my family. I mean, just because that p-value is 0.07 uh, and not 0.05, that, that is a ridiculous uh, reason to write up such a negative um, sounding wording in the abstract. And of course this matters because policymakers will read this and maybe policymakers are thinking of investing in ECMO and say, oh, well, the New England Journal says this is no good. That, that's the interpretation that a lot of them will get. They probably don't even get past the abstract. So the New England Journal has promised to change this just senior statisticians, but um, we'll still see how that plays out in practice. And this is probably the most complicated graph. I uh, probably should just uh, dramatically shorten this. The only one I want you to focus on is the one in the bottom left. So this is some simulated data of, uh, you know, sort of difference between two treatments. The one in the bottom left, that graph there that looks kind of flat, that's what a p-value looks like when there's no difference between two treatments. So what that's saying is if there's no difference between two treatments, a p-value can take any value between zero and one. And considering that most stuff doesn't work, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the time when we're looking at a p-value, we're actually just interpreting noise. We're actually just interpreting something that could be any number. And so it makes me laugh that people get into these wonderful adjectives and wonderful dramatic descriptions about p-values when actually it's, <laughs> it could be anything because there's nothing going on. And if you wanna learn more about p-values, uh, that paper at the bottom, it's very long, but it's very good. And then we did some own work. Uh, this is work I did with Jonathan Wren, uh, which is not yet published. Um, and we extracted from PubMed, we extracted confidence intervals um, for ratio estimates. So hazard ratios, odds ratios, uh, and risk ratios. And we just plotted, this is just all the confidence intervals from abstract. So you can see there's almost a million confidence intervals in there. And we got about 350,000 extracted from the full text as well. This is just using text mining. So if you have a look at the lower interval there, so the orange one uh, in the abstract, you can see that, you know, and, and for, uh, for ratios, you know, the null hypothesis at one, because one means no difference. You can see the, the number of intervals, lower intervals climbs, but then we get to the magic threshold of one and the number of intervals just absolutely uh, explodes because everybody just by chance has just happened to have a confidence interval that's just above one, so just above statistical significance. And then similarly, at the upper interval, you can see the reverse picture, that in the blue line. So just before the interval of one, we see this dramatic uh, increase in the number of intervals, which, which then levels out. So this is, I mean, this is just, not, this just can't be real. This is just absolutely unbelievable. This is evidence for widespread uh, misreporting and, and probably also p-hacking. So people will just continue to analyze their data until they get a statistically significant result. And that's the one they publish. And you never hear about uh, all the results that, that weren't statistically significant. And then, you know, we've all seen uh, this and it's, and I mean, these, these guys are funny, XCD, XKCD, but one of the reasons they're so funny is because, um, <laughs> This kind of stuff, uh, I've heard people <laughs> talk about this and I've seen the, the dismay on people's faces when the p-value is above 
0.05. Um, and unfortunately, I think there are a lot of people out there who do, who will just go back to the drawing board uh, and, and reanalyze the data until they get a pleasing result. And you can, I've seen this, I was involved in a court case in Victoria uh, where there was a discussion of p-values and it was, you know, it was completely wrong. And this was given by an expert. Uh, and I'm sitting there in the courtroom knowing not what to do. So, you know, and we had a look at some, uh, after that experience, decided to look at some other court cases. And this poor guy here um, actually went to prison for, <laughs> for the way he interpreted a p-value. So, and he did it, he did over-interpret it, but um, going to prison seemed a bit harsh for that. Um, he did have shares in the company as well. So there, there was a clear, there, there was a case of fraud. But you can go through the transcript and see some of the things that were said about p-values in the trial. You know, p-value represents the probability the results establish cause and effect relationship. That's just not true. As a general matter, p under uh, 0.05 is statistically significant. And if it's greater than 0.05, it's generally accepted that the results are unreliable. Again, that's just, that's just completely untrue. And a p-value is the likelihood the results you see would have occurred by chance alone. Again, completely untrue. And the p-value is none of these things. And this is in a court case about p-values. And we found plenty of other court cases, not about p-values, but where p-values were being used, where they were just being completely misinterpreted. And this is deciding the lives of people and their liberty. And then I found this study uh, through a colleague and I tweeted this. Uh, it's, these people wrote in a nature journal we continuously increased the number of animals until statistical significance was reached to support our conclusions. So they, they basically just kept collecting data until they got the p-value under 0.05 and then they stopped. And of course, that's a really bad way of doing things because you, you, you are designing a study that will that is guaranteed to overestimate the effect size. It's guaranteed to overestimate the size of what you're interested in. But I mean, it was really interesting. The, the debate that went on under this tweet was a lot, of, a lot of people saying, what's wrong with that? So people generally didn't know um, that this was an issue, which kind of surprised me. Uh, and a lot of people saying, yeah, we do that too. We're just not stupid enough to, to write that in the paper. So, you know, there, that was kind of shocking too. Really. Um, Again, another great illustration from Nature and another great, uh, they had another great paper on this problem. And this, you know, you can see this is cherry picking. And of course, Richard Feynman, a great scientist, is, uh, another great quote. The first principle is that you must uh, not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. We all, and I've been, I, it's happened to me too. You know, you get involved in studies, you, uh, you kind of become um, part of the study and you're kind of rooting for the, the intervention to work you know you want it to work um, and you are you are quite biased and you will um, over egg things and you will uh, interpret things the way you want but of course that's that's not the scientific practice and the best thing you can do for the public is to try and divorce yourself from that and there's some interesting ideas that people shouldn't be uh, one interesting idea because people tend to spin and over egg their results is that um, scientists shouldn't be allowed to write the conclusion section of their paper, but they write the methods and results and then somebody else writes the conclusion because that's where we tend to um, overestimate how great this thing is. And some people are really good at this. I mean, we see, uh, you know, we look at the stars and we, we see a pattern and then uh, people fill the pattern in and then we see other people who are, oh, I can see, uh, oh, I can see Orion in there. I can see a, a warrior in there. So people will, we are, uh, and there's a great book on this called The Tiger That Isn't. As humans, we are programmed to see patterns where they are none. You go back to the p-value, you know, we, we, <laughs> we are remarkable, and, and in scatterpots, we are remarkable uh, at finding patterns and seeing what we want to see. And here's just an example. I won't, I won't give the, the, the citation here because um, I don't like to pick on people, even though that's relatively easy. But this study, you know, they had 102 observations. You can see, so they've got age down the bottom and then they've got uh, some measure up the, the y-axis there. And they've drawn this very wiggly uh, red line. And then they have found a threshold at 81.2 years of age. And then, you know, the paper is written up as the key contribution of this study is the idea that the cutoff value of 81.2 years of age might be considered a threshold for the deterioration of daily living functions in older adults in practice. I mean, you can see how patchy, first of all, you can see how patchy the data is on the y, on the x-axis there. I mean, they, they are claiming this uh, on a remarkably 
small number of participants. Also, I'd argue that is not a threshold. If you believe that red line, that is not a, a threshold. I mean, the risk is continuously decreasing from the age of about 75, uh, or, or the, the function is decreasing from the age of about 75 to 85. It's not a threshold. And also the idea that 81, uh, sorry, the idea that 81.2 years is some magical threshold is just absolute nonsense. <laughs> you know, as if suddenly you hit 81.2 years and, and that's when you're going to decline. I mean, this kind of threshold thinking that we see in p-values, but pe people do use it elsewhere. Um, you know, I think it's an effort to try and uh, interpret things, but, you know, if we can't interpret a, a steadily decreasing risk, um, then, you know, I think we're really, um, we really should be able to interpret steadily changing risks, which are far more uh, biologically plausible than thresholds. So, uh, you know, the simplest study imaginable is, that these are studies I love to work on. There's an exposure. A person takes a pill. That person's reaction is measured five minutes later, and then that person goes home. They are wonderful studies. Uh, you're, you're in control, you see the person, and then you never have to deal with them again. Uh, and this is great. And you get one measure, and you collect a lot of the data on it. This, this is great. What we tend to have a lot of uh, in, the, in the literature at the moment and especially in the era of big data, is we have these massive non-randomized studies where the gap between the exposure and disease can be many years. And there's all these other intervening variables. You know, I'm thinking about some of these big variable, big studies on lifestyle or diet, or uh, you know, what happened to you in childhood. And, and I'm not criticizing all of them because some of them do do a very good job, but there's so much harder to do. You've got to think about all the ways you might have lost people You've got to think about all the competing risks um, that happen. And it really does get quite complicated. I remember there was a study in the UK that beat up the UK about its um, cancer rates, saying that the UK's cancer rates were terrible compared to France. And, you know, that made this big headline and there was questions of parliament and it was all awful. And so somebody actually did the digging. And what they found was that the UK's cancer rates were worse in France because people were dying of heart disease in France at a much earlier age. So the UK was actually doing a good job. They were keeping them alive. But... Um, you know, and there was a much smaller press release on them, but by then, you know, the damage had been done. So a lot of these long, complex things over life are very complicated. Um, but yet people want to do them because they're answering big questions. But, you know, I see people slip up on the simplest studies. So to do this kind of study, you really need to be very experienced and, and very critical of yourself uh, and your data and your models. So what can we do? On to the final things. What, what can I leave with a positive message? Well, first of all, a slight negative message. There's a whole heap of things I haven't mentioned today. Uh, outcome switching, stepwise model selection. People use that all the time. It's a terrible way uh, of, of finding out what your important variables are. Terrible graphs. People don't look at their data quality enough. So this is a bit of a depressing field to, to work in. Uh, and I've only really scratched the surface today at some of the problems. But there are things you can do. If you want to increase your reproducible research, I really think it's worth the time learning R Markdown now, which is in R Studio. So R Markdown is a system that allows you to create word reports that are a mix of, or PDF reports, that are a mix of text and analysis. So you have text and analysis all the way through. So you're essentially creating an exact recipe uh, of what you did, of, of everything that you did in every stage with with beautiful descriptions around it. Because if you come to do it six months later, you know, often you've forgotten what you did, whereas here you have this awesome recipe that you can share with people. Uh, you press a button and uh, the report gets created. A new observation gets added or you slightly change something, you press the button and the whole report gets redone. That is um, really worth learning and has saved me an enormous amount of time. I think the other thing to do that I'm a big fan of, and, and this is not possible for everybody, but to share your data and code where you can. There are, and there are two main reasons for doing that. First of all, other people can use your data and that is, you know, that's, uh, can be very efficient and we can get answers faster and cheaper uh, if there are other hypotheses uh, in your data that you haven't looked at. And studies show that actually 80% of the time when people reuse data is to answer a new hypothesis. It's not to sort of question what you've done. Um, so most of the time people are reusing this data for other purposes, which is, you know, awesome value for science. The other reason I like to share my data and code is that it makes me 
more careful about my data and code because I'm constantly thinking well, somebody else uh, could look at this. And I think that's a great uh, incentive and, and keeps me on my toes. User research checklist. So Doug Altman, who we saw earlier, you know, this is just a very simple thing. So for, for almost every study that there is out there, um, and we can see that the common ones there are randomized trials, observational studies, there is a research checklist, which is a checklist to help you write up your research. You know, have I mentioned this? Have I mentioned that? Did, it, did I mention this? Because it's amazing the things we will miss. This is actually all even great at the design stage of research, um, especially if you're doing a more complicated study like a diagnostic study. Uh, I really recommend the STAR D criteria. Again, it takes a little bit of extra time, is, is now required by some journals, but that little bit of extra time um, can actually have massive benefits. If somebody's reading your paper five years down the line and actually want to you know, interpret this, it's going to be much easier for them if you've actually um, given all the details on what you actually did. Look, writing protocols and analysis plans. So, you know, uh, there's no uh, image for this because this is really boring, but it's really essential. You write a protocol of what you were going to you're going to do that gets discussed by all the investigators uh, and then you do that and you don't deviate from that or if you deviate from that you, you, you clearly write up this was a deviation from the protocol this is the way science works we have an idea we test that idea and then we reflect we don't get the data look at a thousand ideas and then uh, pick the one that's most appealing too many people are doing that we need to get back to this kind of um, classical way of, of doing science. And of course, I mean, just last year, or just this year actually, um, a very interesting analysis in PLOS that, that compared papers that wrote a protocol and stuck to a protocol compared with papers that didn't. And the effect size in papers that wrote a protocol was, was tiny, was far, far smaller um, than those that didn't, which is you know a lot more negative papers, which are a lot harder to publish, um, but a lot closer to the truth and a lot better value for the public. Scrambling and blinding, I'm a big fan of. Um, so, you know, there are ways to do that where you, uh, so in the graph on the left, what I've done is I've created a completely random treatment group. Um, so this, this is not the real data. So just to get people uh, thinking about the study results, okay, here's what the study results are gonna look like. Do you all agree? Is this an analysis you understand? Uh, and then once everybody's happy with the analysis, then you can actually show them a report that, that uses the real treatments. Uh, and I think the reason for that is you get, you get little mistakes ironed out, everybody's clear on what you're doing, because I unfortunately I have been involved in projects where when the p-value was above the magic 0.05 threshold, people were constantly asking for new analysis because you know they constantly, they wanted, they were invested in the treatment. Uh, and we've had really bad cases actually where we got threatened with being taken to court and things like that. So I've learned to do this because once you've done that and everybody's agreed this is the analysis you've got, you're on far stronger ground to say no i'm not doing that because this this is p hacking you're, you're trying to get um a significant result and of course the other great thing to do uh which archie cochran did I think, years and years ago is to blind the treatment so the, the graph on the right there shows the survival curves and i've just i've not put the real treatment labels on there so people have to make a decision you know people might be very invested in one of those treatments they have to make a decision um, that, that's, that's more honest, you know, is that a significant difference in mortality? Um, and people say, oh, Adrian, you don't trust me, do you? And I say, no, I don't trust you, I don't trust myself, I don't trust anybody. We've, we've been uh, demonstrated to be untrustworthy. So uh, let's get over that. I actually think we've got to the stage where random audits of researchers um, would be useful. And we've written a paper on this, and this is a very interesting uh, article just recently in Nature. Uh, where this, uh, not a statistician, but actually an anesthetist, John Carlyle, um, just started off finding a couple of suspicious papers and then, and then has spent a lot of his spare time um, looking through suspicious papers. And what they do is a simple thing. They look at the baseline table in randomized trials. And you can look at, uh, you know, where, where people show, okay, the ages in this group were this and the sex distribution in the treatment and control group is this. And where people make up data, they tend to make up data that's, that's too good to be true. And so you can spot this statistically, and he has had, uh, by doing this, he's had a lot of, uh, he's uncovered a lot of uh, research fraud. I like the idea of audits just to keep people on their toes. I think if you randomly audit a small number of people and read their papers in detail, I think that has the potential to dramatically shift the incentives away from 
uh, these sort of uh, publication numbers and citation numbers to actually um, quality research. But, you know, this is a very controversial idea. I think we should scrap lead tables. I think lead tables are awful and we need universities to start focusing um, on you know, what they're actually delivering. And, and I won't go through it because uh, I've been going on too long, but I really love this table. It just uh, starts off about Professor Johnson's, what she actually does, and then it goes further and further down into the sort of derivative um, uh, comparisons until we just get how much money uh, she's received. So that's a great paper by Aura and Aura there. And I would advocate as well for more meta-research. This is the cover of science um, from September last year. So this meta-research area is growing. So you can see there the people in lab coats looking at other people in lab coats. This is what the meta-researchers do. I don't know why they need a parallelogram there. Or, um, but um, I think this is interesting that, that at least we're being a bit more reflective now and there's a recognition that um, we can do science better and we can use science to make science better. So we can investigate what the problems are and, and try and uh, improve. And that is all I wanted to say. Tilly, are we going to do the Q&A or? Yeah, sorry about that. I was trying to unmute and um, wasn't being very um, successful there. So um, I have one question online. Um, so it says, thanks, Adrian. This was a really interesting presentation. This is from Natalie Strobel. In regards to writing a data analysis plan, do you publish them or put them up on websites such as Open Science Framework? Alternatively, is this more about saying you have completed a protocol and adding it as a supplement? Yeah, look, I think either. I think I probably would. If you've gone to the trouble of writing a protocol analysis plan, then it doesn't have to be published in a journal, like you said. Yeah, you can just stick it on the Open Science Framework. The great thing about that is it's on there, it gets a DOI, it's date stamped, it's findable, you know, it, it's clear, it's there it's done uh, and you know you can still change a protocol later but you just write a little addendum so and yeah and that's free and cheap and yeah i mean the more the basic idea is the more thinking you do up front before you actually touch your data the better quality it's going to be after so it is worth spending that time writing a protocol and analysis plan because it will pay off later on and, it, you know, if you've got a big study with a lot of money, then you can actually, yeah, uh, or you've got a lot of time, you can get the protocol published as another paper. Uh, and, and then that goes through peer review. Although we have had weird, <laughs> we've got some weird examples now, you know, where we, we've published a protocol and the reviewers have suggested a change to, <laughs> to the protocol. And, well, this is, this is about to start next month. So, um, yeah, there is a danger of that. So, yeah, in a way that, Getting feedback at that stage can sometimes be too late. You know. So if Natalie doesn't mind, I want to just add a question on to that because I'm curious, how do people get through ethics if they don't have a protocol? Because you have to write a protocol to get through ethics, at least at our HREC. Um, and then that opens up the problem for many of us. So for people like me who support clinicians uh, in a health service, accessing good epidemiologists and statisticians, despite being within close proximity of a university, still leaves open those difficulties. And so it's more of a comment than a question, but any suggestions that you have to fill that gap would be welcome. Yeah, well look, there, there's a worldwide shortage of statisticians. Um, there's, we only have 800 members in the Stat Society uh, across the country. So, you know, and the vast majority of them are in Melbourne and Sydney. So, yeah. and, the, and the vast majority of them are incredibly busy because, uh, you know, we are having this, this explosion in big data and, and it's become a, a sort of sexy job. And there are, you know, there are some really interesting things you can do with that. So we're all kind of, uh, I'm constantly turning away work. So what I would say is if you don't, if you can't get access to a statistician, the best thing you can do is to, do a really simple study. And really simple studies can still be really fantastic. You know, a simple randomized trial that you do all the hard work in the randomization and the study design. And then the stats is actually quite easy. You know, and, and I know randomization, you know, might not be for everybody, but even simple pre-post designs, you know, oh, here's what our health service looked like last year. Here's what it looks like this year, you know, with some summary statistics, 
and of course now that is uh, subject to confounding, you know, if there've been other changes or, you know, um, but as long as you talk about that and document that, I still think there's, there's very interesting things to be found in the data that don't necessarily need complicated analysis. Like these, these longitudinal studies, like I talked about over lifetimes, they are complicated and you need really high qualified statisticians and epidemiologists to do those. But there's a lot of stuff at your local level, um, you know, this data that is not getting looked at that, that you can make a contribution to with a little bit of training. Thanks, Adrian. Um, there's some more questions coming through, so I will read out the next one. So this one's from Amy, and she says, as a HDR student dipping my toes into mixed methods research, I'm reflecting on research lens bias in the qualitative component of my study, wondering if there may be some benefit to the same approach in quantitative methodologies to recognise uh, the biases that we bring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we are. Um it, talking about it is probably you know like the first stage to recognizing it so i'm glad that there's uh that there's a recognition but yeah no i mean i've been i've i've noticed it in myself uh, and I'm, you know i'm not putting myself there up as a perfect scientist and, and i see it all the time in others and it's hard sometimes as a statistician as well i have to deliver bad news and i'm actually not that good at doing that either i do like to um there is an inherent you know desire to please people and give them a pleasing result and, and the studies I've been involved in that have a pleasing result are, are so much easier to, to do because everybody's happy the ones with a bad result you know people are unhappy they say oh we did this wrong um, so yeah no I agree the, that that bias the research lens bias how we look at research it is very important and we do need to recognize it and getting other people's opinions and 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 trying to be as scientific as you can, I think it's, it's the best we can do. Yeah, I agree. Uh, we have a question from Maria Hennessy. She says, thanks, Adrian, for a fabulous talk. She's curious to hear about your take on sample size calculations. Okay, so there's a great paper in the BMJ. Uh, it's called Sample Size Calculations. Are the emperor's clothes made to measure or uh, off the peg or something like that? So the, the biggest thing that, well, there's so many things that upset me about sample size calculations. The biggest thing that upsets me about sample size calculations, the study that can do the best sample size calculation is a study that has good data on the effect size, uh, good data on the dropout rate, good data on the variance, good data on the correlations between variables. If you've got good data on all those things, that probably means a similar study has already been done. In which case, why on earth are you doing this study? If the exact same study has been done and we know all those parameters really well, why are you doing this study? On the flip side, we have these studies that are you know, really novel and really new. Maybe this is the first time in humans or uh, the, first, the first study after animals or the, or the first study in animals or the first study in a whole new um, uh, area or health service they don't have very good sample size calculations because it is a complete guess. And they're the ones that will get hammered in peer review. Oh, you don't have a good sample size calculation. But they're the studies that are truly novel. So that paper I mentioned in the BMJ um, just came with a conclusion. You have small, medium, and large studies. And I think small was 20, uh, medium was about 80, and large was about 200. And that's recognizing that this, this whole sample size calculation thing. And I think some of the reason is you have these a calculation and equations that kind of gives it this veneer of being accurate. It's not accurate. It's, it's a total guess. And you can change your sample size calculations very easily by changing your assumptions. So yeah, again, it's this bit like p-values. It's this thing that's kind of on a pedestal. But when you look at it, I mean, the, the pedestal is, is, you know, really got a lot of termite damage and it's not, it's not something that um, we should promote. Again, of course, I will say it's, they're worth doing because it's worth putting thought into, and I still do advocate doing a sample size calculation, but let's not think that that number is some magical number that's gonna deliver you the study that you actually, that everybody needs. Yeah, I've had trouble getting uh, stuff through ethics committees without sample size calculation. Yeah, they're, they're another place that, yeah, that will really block it. And um, 
can't seem to handle the fact that there may be some uncertainty, <laughs> which is what research is. <laughs> yeah. So Adrian, I do have a couple more. We've got a few more minutes, so I will carry on. So uh, Bernadette Woods asks, what are your suggestions about protocols for large longitudinal observational cohort studies? And she's asking for five to 10 years. There are always additional questions that can be asked, particularly when questions are added over time. Do you do updated protocols? Sure, yeah, you, look, you can update your protocol. I mean, uh, I do, like, as I said, I, I advocate writing a protocol, but sometimes when, yeah, when you're collecting the data or when you actually start to see the data or when you get more involved in the study or things happen, ideas do occur to you uh, and that's fine. You just have to kind of date and stamp start, uh, time and date stamp those ideas. So it, it's clear when you have that idea. And I think as long as you have that idea before you have a really big look at your data, um, I think that's fine. I mean, I think the protocol, these labs observational studies over time, yeah, they are the most challenging because you really, you know, if they're non-randomized, you, you, the confounders can be really uh, sneaky and difficult and, and need a lot of thought. So you need to have a lot of meetings with experts. You need to map out all the possible confounders and all the possible routes that you can. And I mean, I have seen, so a student just recently, you know, we actually put in the appendix, we put our, our causal diagram or what we think the associations were and I really like those because and for these large observational studies that they can be really messy um, mm. but if that's the truth then then that's the truth and then it's easier for for people to question your assumptions in it I mean questioning in you know the, the scientific way well I'm not sure if that's right or have you thought about this um, it just makes it very clear so yeah clarity and, and again pre-planning um, if people have done all that then I'm not gonna criticize them you know if they end up getting it wrong Yep, yep. We have another one from Sally Hall. Um, thanks for a great presentation. You alluded briefly to problems with stepwise models. Can you talk about better alternatives to model selection? Sure. So the stepwise, uh, it, it's two things that's wrong with the stepwise. It doesn't work in steps. I don't know why it had the word step in it. It works in these huge leaps. The model will change dramatically depending on what variables are in or not. Uh, and then also it's not wise. It, it doesn't really, like repeated studies have shown that it will often find the wrong model. Um, but it's very popular because people have been training it, it's available in all the packages and it, and it does do a sort of nice job of taking very many variables down to a few. So the method that I really recommend, which is becoming more popular, is a thing called the lasso. So what the lasso does is it doesn't switch variables off and on, it kind of, if you think about it, like a lasso around a group of variables, it kind of draws them all together and then variables will kind of drop out, but it, it's a much more gradual process. Uh, and studies have shown lots of um, good stats studies, uh, you know, on simulated data and on real data showing that it gives far more realistic results. And the other thing that a lasso does is it uses cross validation. So it will build a model on a small amount of the data and test that on data that it hasn't seen. And again, that gives far more realistic reproducible results than just taking all your data using the stepwise. You get these very tailored models that are unstable and don't provide good predictions for future data because all they're good at is the data they've already seen. They're not so good then when you, when you present them with, with new data, which is of course most of the time, we're not just interested in that one data set. We wanna make predictions into the future. Yeah. So um, now that is that a complex process? You know, you did suggest you know access to statisticians. You know, um, research and know this. Yeah. Look, the, one one good thing about the stats community is we we're actually there's a good of there's quite a lot of uh, online training for free that's quite good, and then there are other like the data camp ones that are not free but they're pretty low cost and they're, they're worth the effort. And you know they have these courses where you can dip in and out of them and, and do it at your own time. So again, I would say considering all the effort you've put into collecting this data, spending a couple of days or maybe even a week learning a new technique that you could then maybe use for the rest of your research career, um, I think that's worthwhile. Of course, I mean, the mathematics of the lasso do get quite complicated. You don't have to understand all of that. If you understand what it's doing, 
and how it's working and what the results are showing, um, then I think that's good enough. Um, sorry, I was just reading a, um, a question here, Adrian, um, from Annette uh, Paschke, and she's asking about what about multiple testing? And I'm just trying to work out where that would have been. Yeah, look, that's on p-values. Yeah, multiple testing. The, the big issue with multiple testing is, I mean, I, it doesn't bother me so much. The multiple testing becomes a huge issue if you have this bright line thinking. If you have, this is significant, this is not. Then that's when multiple testing becomes an issue because people will test a million hypotheses and, and therefore say, oh, this is significant. If you just look at each bit of evidence and each p-value on its own merits, you can avoid that whole problem. Now, there are people who will just dredge and test hundreds of hundreds of, uh, uh, you know, hypotheses. But I would argue you can spot that, oh, well, as long as they've reported that, you know, you can spot that and judge it yourself. I mean, I think this mania for uh, adjusting uh, p-value thresholds and, and um, because of multiple testing, and again, I've had arguments with reviewers about this, it, it's only really a problem if if you have a threshold for a p-value and, and a lot of us are trying to argue well first of all don't use p-values as much or use them lower down and certainly if you use them don't have a threshold interpret them on their own merits mm. so um we do have uh, another question from geraldine mccarrick and she's asking about if you have any comments on the measures of quality of qualitative research such as saturation, credibility, transferability, et cetera, and their acceptability in the health setting. Sorry, totally out of my field. <laughs> Sounds interesting, but yeah. thought that might be. And I'm just going to use my um, time um, that's left. There's only a couple of minutes, but I just want to ask about um, where the R markdown. Now you described that and, and I was taught to do, you know, to write out um, or at least to print out uh, my um, entries when I was using SPSS. Is that when you're using the R package? Yes, sorry. So yeah, that's that's via R Studio. So there's, there's the R software, which is totally free. Yep. Then there's this group in California who have made R Studio, which is a, a front end for R. So it just makes R look nice. And again, that is totally free. It's becoming better all the time. And then, yeah, within that, you've got another thing called R Markdown, which is where you can write, you can write reports that mix code and, you know, your, your thoughts. And they're really very nice. They look exactly like uh, a, a nice Word document. You can insert uh, figures. Uh, and then you've got this record of everything you've ever done. Now, of course, this doesn't need you to learn Ah, and of course you do need to learn R Markdown. But again, I would say, uh, particularly for R Markdown and R, there are some really excellent online uh, courses now. Uh, and I would, and you know, some some of my students, I've switched them from SPSS to R, and they say how grateful they are because R is becoming the dominant package. Lots of people mm -hmm. are using it. It is way better than SPSS. It is. It can do. Um, so many things that SPSS can't do and almost everybody in the SAS community is using it now. There are still a few hangers on in Stata, but um, you know, certainly any of these new techniques uh, that come through, they're all available in that. And of course, all the good old ones as well that you know, I use 95% of the time are in there. Yeah, okay. So Adrian, we are out of time. So I do want to thank you very much. Um, and thanks for everybody for um, joining in on the webinar. Um, now, Sarah will put your slides um, in the presentation up um, shortly on the um, Health Services Research Association's website. So uh, do tell your colleagues about the presentation and, and encourage them to look at, uh, up the website. I still have a page of questions to ask you, uh -huh. Adrian, but I won't get around to that. But thank you very much. That was great. Thank you, Tilly. Bye, everybody. Bye.